Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for your patience. I apologize for the, the technical glitch and the delay in getting started. If you're here for the Entrust Group webinar, a look at investing in the Bakken oil field through a self-directed IRA, you're in the right place. We're just a little bit late. Uh, my name is Gary Kowalski. I'm the Director of Sales for the Entrust Group, and we have with us today special guest Troy Eckerd, CEO of Eckerd Global. We're going to go ahead and just get right into uh, the presentation here. We're going to start with the agenda. Um, in a moment, I'll go through a little bit about who the Entrust Group is and introduce Troy and, and give a little bit of a bio on he and his firm. Um, then I will spend probably the next uh, 12 to 15 minutes speaking about self-directed IRAs, the basics of them, what they are, uh, some of your options available to you, and some of the advantages as well as the things you can and cannot invest in. Uh, thereafter, I'll hand the baton to Troy, who will walk through uh, the state of the U.S. oil and gas market as we know it today. And then he's going to take a deeper dive and a look into the Bakken itself, which is a, a fascinating area. Um, forgive the pun, but he's going to drill down into the Bakken by the numbers. He'll walk through the methods of drilling being used, um, he's got some data points on production and who the top producers are, what they're doing, uh, the different types of investments uh, that people are making and that are available. Uh, and he'll walk through kind of some of the advantages um, for investing through a self-directed IRA and some uh, of those that are more advantageous outside an IRA. Uh, he'll then go through some of the elements of due diligence necessary and then walk through um, the basics of tax considerations for these types of investments. Uh, Troy will probably speak for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. You should have a chat box uh, on your screen. I believe it's in the lower left-hand corner. And uh, if you have a question during the presentation, just go ahead and key it in. Most of those will probably wait until the end of the presentation to discuss. Um, but feel free to type it in as you wish. And um, again, thanks so much for your patience this morning. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So again, I uh, work for the Entrust Group as its Director of Sales. And who is Entrust? Entrust is one of the leading administrators of self-directed retirement plans in the country. Um, we've been doing this for more than 30 years. We're um, one of the leaders. And we have roughly $4 billion in client assets under administration. There are two key points I would say that are um, important to know about Entrust as you're looking at different retirement plan administrators. One is we really pride ourselves on education. Uh, we conduct a lot of events like this webinar to try to present new and different ideas for your consideration. We also do a lot of in-person events in our local offices, and we have a national continuing education program uh, for people with different professional certifications uh, where you can earn points uh, to maintain that certification. Uh, the second is our local office and designated representative model. The industry norm um, for a self-directed retirement plan is to call the company with an 800 number, walk through your scenario, you usually will have multiple phone calls with them, but each person, uh, sorry, each time you call, you'll get a different person on the phone, and you're oftentimes speaking uh, really from scratch with your scenario. With Entrust, you have a designated representative from day one. They work with you uh, from the um, account establishment stage all the way through the transaction and the account maintenance stage. So. They know you. They understand what your goals and objectives are and how you're uh, going about them. And they're there to work with you and try to support you start to finish. And as I mentioned earlier, Troy uh, Eckerd is our special guest this morning. Um, he is the CEO of Eckerd Global, which is a privately held energy asset management company specialized in energy asset management oil and gas investing, and alternative investment opportunities. Troy has 28 years of energy industry experience. He's a former licensed investment broker and principal and CEO of his own investment firm for about 17 years. He's had a career specialized in developing and managing private equity investments, and he's been involved either as a managing partner, aligned investor, 
or as an issuer of investment securities that have involved the drilling and exploration, completion, and distribution of revenues for wells that have resulted in drilling depths that exceeded uh, 3 million uh, square feet and uh, covered more than 3,000 square miles of mineral acres of leases in seven states. And that's a bit of a mouthful, so I hope that came out okay. Um, Troy is the chairman of the board of Triangle Energy Services Corp. He is a principal partner in Connecticut Partners. He's the CEO of both Eckerd Global and Eckerd Recovery Services, and he's the president of American Energy Partners, Inc. And Troy will be taking over the presentation in um, a few slides from now. Uh, before we begin the formal educational piece, um, I would like to convey that uh, the interest group and this presentation is uh, meant to be for educational purposes only. We don't endorse um, or provide any investment advice, and we strongly uh, encourage that prior to making any investments, you work with and discuss those uh, with a professional advisor, CPA, uh, attorney, whomever uh, you seek your financial counsel from. I want to begin with the basics, as I mentioned in the agenda slide. What is a self-directed IRA? Uh, most people know uh, IRAs by going to a Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, those kinds of firms where you will invest uh, in a menu of publicly traded securities or stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, uh, CDs, that kind of thing. Self-directed is really an IRA that um, enables you to invest in a much wider array of assets, and they're, they're really referred to as non-traditional assets, such as real estate or oil and gas ventures, uh, precious metals, privately held companies, and you can also um, lend out of your IRA. But the large banks and brokers won't allow you to do that because those are not products that they traditionally offer. So I'll walk through in a minute what you can invest in through your IRA, but in some respects, it's easier to begin with what you cannot because the list is pretty slim. There's really three things that you cannot invest in through your IRA. First is collectibles. So if you have a passion for baseball and want to invest in a baseball card uh, collection through your IRA, uh, unfortunately, that's considered a hobby and you cannot do that. Um, similarly, if you wanted to invest in wine or works of art, those are specifically prohibited. You'll notice on the slide in front of you that it says metals or gems, stamps, or coins, that those are prohibited. That's correct. Um, there are exceptions in the metals arena. Certain gold, silver, platinum, and palladium uh, you can invest in, and it's specifically prescribed in the Internal Revenue Code. Um, the requirement really is that they meet certain purity specifications, but they're absolutely um, something you can invest in. Uh, if you have questions on that, just uh, give a call to the 800 number at the bottom of the, the slide, and uh, we can connect you with our Precious Metal Center to uh, try to clarify that for you. Um, the second is life insurance, which is prohibited in an IRA, and then S-Corp law also uh, prohibits IRAs from making investments in those. Apart from that, it's really um, the limits of your imagination. You can invest in uh, vegetable con uh, uh, containers of vegetable oil coming from South America. We've had clients invest in ATM machines, all kinds of different things. So we're going to move along to some of the advantages of self-directed IRAs. I, I kind of like to bundle the first two bullets together. Um, really the second one first, invest in what you know and understand. I think the true benefit behind self-direction is that many, many people um, looking to save for retirement don't know or don't feel comfortable with the publicly traded securities markets, um, and they want to handle their investments on their own rather than um, you know, go pay a, a financial advisor perhaps. They may know and understand real estate particularly well or um, uh, again, the metals arena, or they may have insights on a private company that they've been following for a long time. Those are the types of things that you can invest in through your IRA that most people just don't know about. Um, or they're investing in real estate separately, and now they realize, ah, I can do that with my IRA. 
this is terrific. And of course, oil and gas concerns as well, um, which Troy will be speaking about. Um, one of the advantages to that is diversification. Um, there's nothing wrong by any stretch with the public securities markets. Uh, uh, they certainly provide potential opportunities there uh, for your IRA. Um, however, um, by opening it up and expanding your, your, your options, it allows you to diversify and create a more balanced portfolio. Um, last are the, the tax savings or tax advantages. Um, within uh, your IRA, the contributions uh, may be tax deductible, and the earnings will always grow either tax deferred or tax free, depending upon the type of IRA you set up. And so we're going to take a look at those right now. Um, what are my options? We'll begin with um, individual retirement accounts, and then I'll, I'll quickly walk through the small business accounts we have available, and then what I would call uh, specialized accounts. Uh, within the IRA uh, category, we have traditional and Roth. Traditional is by far the most common. Uh, the contributions may be tax deductible. The earnings grow tax deferred until such time that you take a distribution. Um, after that, the next most common we see is a Roth. And Roth has a few characteristics that make it unique and oftentimes extremely compelling. The first is that while the contributions you make are not uh, tax deductible, uh, in other words, you're using after-tax dollars to uh, contribute, the earnings within the, the account will grow tax deferred so long as they're vested for five years. So it's a common age is 35 to 45 or 50 to start contributing most heavily to your retirement account. If you can afford to do that uh, through a Roth, by the time you go taking distributions 20, 25, 30 years later, everything that you uh, distribute at that time in the future, both the contributions and the earnings, is tax-free. And so there can be some uh, terrific scenarios there for leveraging the earnings to grow your account and then uh, never having to pay taxes on it again. Uh, the other interesting thing about a Roth that can have a uh, great advantage for certain folks is that whereas a traditional and other types of IRAs you have to begin uh, taking distributions no later than the age of 70 and a half, with a Roth there is no requirement. So when you reach 70 and a half, you can continue um, building and reinvesting that account, and you don't have to take any, any distribution. You can continue building that till you're 80, 85, 90 before ever taking anything. Uh, and that is unique to the Roth and, and again, can provide certain advantages for certain folks. Uh, within the small business account section, we have three different types of plans. We have the simplified employee pension, uh, savings incentive match plan, and the individual 401k. Uh, the simp uh, Simplified Employee Pension, or the SEP, is by far the most common for us. And it can be very compelling for uh, an individual business owner or somebody who runs a small business because you can actually set aside up to 25% of your uh, annual earnings up to a cap of $51,000 per year. So it's a terrific way to shelter some of the income and uh, contribute large sums to your retirement plan within a short amount of time. Um, the, it's also fairly easy, um, easy to set up and easy to administer. Uh, the simple plans are less common. Um, therefore, companies with 100 or fewer employees, and that's a plan where the employer and the employee contribute uh, to the employee accounts. Um, uh, they, again, they have certain advantages for small companies. They're um, much easier to set up and establish than a 401k. Uh, the contribution limits are a little bit lower, but for certain scenarios they can fit quite well. Um, the 401k, the individual K, is a plan for um, a small business owner as an individual or in conjunction with their spouse or partner. And uh, it's a 401k that you can invest in alternative assets through. Um, so with the 401k, you have a uh, little bit larger contribution limits on an annualized basis than some of the IRAs. You can contribute up to $17,500. Uh, 
And uh, 401k plans also allow you to um, borrow with certain restrictions. So for certain scenarios, that can be um, very advantageous as well. Uh, lastly, we have the ESAs and HSAs. The ESA is an education savings account. Uh, contributions for that are not tax deductible. However, the earnings and the principal uh, when withdrawn are uh, or distributed are tax-free if used for qualified education savings. Uh, or I'm sorry, qualified educational expenses. So they're, they're really meant as, as college savings plans. The HSA is a health savings account um, similar to uh, the ESA, it's, uh, except that the, the contributions are uh, tax deductible or can be. Uh, you must have a high deductible health plan in order to qualify. But if you take the distributions um, specific to qualified health uh, expenses, both the principal and the earnings uh, can be withdrawn tax-free. So those are just kind of a broad brush stroke over those plans. Uh, again, if you have further questions on them, um, please give a call to the number at, at the bottom of the slide there, and we'll be happy to help out. We'll take a quick look here at the things you can invest in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, real estate is very common. It's virtually any kind of real estate from residential to commercial. Lots of clients investing um, in properties internationally. Uh, there's been a lot more interest in things such as farmland and agricultural opportunities of late. Precious metals, hedged or pooled funds arrangements, arrangements. Uh, secured or unsecured loans. Really almost anything is eligible except the life insurance, collectibles, and S-Corps. It's really up to your imagination. Oil and gas ventures is what we're here to speak about today. You can absolutely invest in those through an IRA. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Troy, uh, who's going to have a fascinating discussion with us today on the Bakken fields up in uh, North Dakota. So Troy, please um, Take it away. Sounds good. First off, everyone, thank you for joining the call. I know everybody has uh, busy schedules, and for you to be able to tap into this webinar and, and uh, participate, we really appreciate your time. Uh, a couple of things I should start off with is that uh, I just came in from Montana this weekend where we had our annual uh, partners conference where we have all of our partners in place, and basically just spent the last three days going over all the investment components of energy from pipelines to saltwater disposal wells to expiration, royalty funds. And so we've had a really uh, interesting last three days doing a little fly fishing and enjoying the beautiful Montana skyline. And um, so I'm uh, rested and, and uh, looking very excited and, and uh, well poised to uh, go through the bucket and what's going on up there. Uh, the second thing I can tell you is, is that uh, I myself have been doing IRAs since I was old enough to have a job, and I've been utilizing self-directed IRAs myself in things like investing in businesses and energy and, and what have you. So I'm very familiar with the self-directed IRA uh, arena. And I can tell each one of you on the phone, it's an absolutely uh, incredible tool to be able to invest through your self-directed IRA into assets that you believe are going to have high growth or growth because it allows you to trap those earnings inside of a vehicle that defers the tax liability as well as be able to continue to increase the size of that portfolio. So uh, I'm a, a big uh, advocate of self-directed IRAs. So I actually started a medical collection company using my IRA, and that company is doing extremely well. And as a result, my IRA just keeps getting fatter and fatter. So I always enjoy the opportunity to talk about things that are uh, investments in uh, vehicles that I use myself. Uh, just to give you a quick background, I started off in the oil and gas industry in 1985. Um, I just turned 49 years old, and all I've done my entire career is work on oil and gas in, in a number of different uh, elements or, or space within the energy uh, industry. And that's involved in exploration, seismic, uh, saltwater disposal wells, production, pipelines. So I've got a very, very broad knowledge. And what we want to do this morning is just kind of give you an idea of what's going on in the United States when it comes to the oil and gas industry. Let's take a look at this slide that's on your screen now, which is you know, where the average annual U.S. oil price is. And 
What I'm here to tell you is that uh, the United States is probably in the best position it has been in in the last uh, 50 to 60 years when it comes to uh, energy. And the reason why we are in the best position is the fact that two things have occurred. One is that the United States um, has put itself in the position right now to be kind of the economic leader in the world. We've been that way for a number of years. But with the economic chaos in 2008 and 2009, um, it still looks like the United States is still in the best position economically. Well, if that's true, but yet we still feel like we're kind of in this recessionary uh, vacillation, and we're still running $94 to $110 a barrel, it bodes extremely well for the energy industry as to what the price of a barrel of oil or an MCF of gas will in fact be worth when the economy does recover. So my point is as follows. If you look at the chart from 2008 to 2012, other than a short drop in 2009, the marketplace clearly has demonstrated that the oil and gas that we produce domestically or on a global basis is worth a lot more money than it was 10 years ago. And if that's the case, we now have a new norm. The new norm is probably a range of $75 a barrel to maybe $125 a barrel for crude oil. And it doesn't matter whether it's produced internationally or produced domestically. So from a consumer's standpoint, energy is going to be very expensive relative to a decade ago. From an investor's standpoint, it's the place you want to be. You want to be in a space where the demand is constant and increasing and where the supply is always diminishing. It's the bottom line of Economics 101. Currently, I think oil is trading at $106 a barrel today, and I anticipate we have a very strong trading range between that level, like I explained, $75 to $145 a barrel. Inside the oil and gas industry, though, we would really prefer it to be around $95 a barrel because we do not want to end up uh, choking off the economy, nor do we want to have increased uh, competition from alternative fuels such as wind or nuclear or hydro. So from, this, from the oil and gas industry, we like around $95 a barrel. seems to be a good working price. The next slide just simply kind of tells you about, about why the oil and gas industry is, in fact, a good investment. For one, it's a great inflation hedge. Traditionally, whenever inflation kicks in, oil prices and commodity prices in the energy space have a tendency to rise at or faster than inflation. And the nicest thing you can do is be in an a energy investment because it's a great deterrent to your portfolio, allowing you to make gains in the energy investments while the, the uh, alternative investments such as maybe the private equities or the equity market is taking a little bit of a retreat. Um, as you look at the, the different things that are going on inside the, uh, the world today, the Syria issues and all the geopolitical pressures, um, what we have is we have a very clear understanding that, that the world does not move without a barrel of oil being burnt whether it be the manufacturing facilities or the cars we drive or the clothes we wear, um, no matter how much windmills we put up in, in the air, oil and gas is the number one and will be for quite a long time the number one source of fuel. And There's really not anything else we can do about it. As what I've told many of my partners for the last decade is, until they figure out how to pave highways and make clothes out of anything but petroleum, I think the petroleum industry is going to have a very solid foundation. Now, what I'm going to do is give you a quick view of a map and an overview of the United States for most of you who have not had the opportunity to really look into the shale plays, and shale is simply the type of rock. It's a shale, S-H-A-L-E type of formation that historically has been considered a hydrocarbon, meaning it has organic material trapped in the shale, but from a mechanical perspective, it was never able to be understood how you can extract those oil and gas molecules out of a formation that was tighter than concrete. Well, about 17 years ago, uh, George Mitchell with Mitchell Energy finally perfected, after millions of dollars and nearly two decades of expertise, figured out how to release those molecules from these shale plays. And what you have now is the United States that is in an energy revolution. We're not talking about a, just a small changeover in the energy space. We're talking about a complete 180 degree changeover in the way the energy industry is being run. We're talking billions and billions of dollars are being invested in technology and in lease acquisitions of mineral interest across the United States because these shales are everywhere. Right now, I believe we have 25 states of the United States now contains commercial quantities of shale, gas, or oil. And it looks like, from the exploration side, that could increase to as many as 30 states in the United States. So instead of just Texas or Louisiana always predominantly having the oil and gas, or even some over in California, you're now talking about states that traditionally were oil and gas, a little bit of production. Now we're talking in massive quantities, such as North Dakota, Montana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, states that, that really have never been on the top ten are now right in the limelight. 
Now, when you see the circles on the map, the reason those circles are there is because our company and our partners over the last two decades, we've been involved in shale and, and non-conventional resource plays, and we've been involved in five different plays or five different uh, formations, the Barnett, the Almas, the Austin Chalk, the Bossier, et cetera. And so when we come to you, we're coming to you from a very uh, lengthy expertise and a lengthy experience uh, portfolio of dealing in these shale plays long before the, the last three years of, hey, the shale is taking off. We've been drilling shale wells and non-conventional wells since the late 1980s. Now, let's talk about the Bakken in particular, because um, when you have a, a almost a 30-year career in energy, you kind of have a, a broad spectrum on understanding the different shale plays and why maybe the Bakken shale play, which is predominantly in North Dakota and Montana, why those two particular states and this particular oil field is maybe better than any other oil field in the country. And it really boils down to a couple of three things. First off, it is one of the highest liquids rich basins. And what that means is either natural gas liquids and or crude oil seems to be 85 to 90 percent of the product that is being extracted by a newly drilled well inside of the uh, Montana, North Dakota field. And that is very, very important considering right now you're looking at about a seven to ten times higher value for crude oil and natural gas liquids than you do for natural gas. If I'm going to have to go drill a well, and any oil company that you may decide to look at either as a public equity or as an uh, individual private investment, it's important to know that the product you're going to extract is giving you the greatest value. A shift occurred 18 months ago where the energy industry realized that natural gas was way abundant. They had all the natural gas they could find. The problem is that success in these shale plays and that natural gas drove the natural gas price down so low that really it's tough to make economic sense. But the flip side occurred in oil and gas. We had our nice drop in, in April of 2009 where oil dropped down to $32 a barrel for a short period of time, but quickly rose back over to $90 a barrel over the next 12 months. What that tells you is that the global product of crude oil has clearly demonstrated on a macro level that oil is worth at least $90 a barrel up to $120. So from the Bakken, it has a lot of things going for it. First is it's high in liquid. Secondly is very, very high success ratio. Other than mechanical failure, you're dealing with about a 96 to 99 percent success rate every time a well is drilled. The wells are averaging about $9 million per well. Uh, what you're talking about is wells with expected economic life of 25 to 40 years. So let's put it in real estate terms. You're going to build a $9 million building. You're going to put tenants in there. They're going to pay your rent for 25 to 40 years. Your tenants may pay a lot more in the beginning because you've got to get back to your cost for building that building. In the oil and gas industry, specifically in the Bakken, these wells come on very large in the beginning. They produce a lot of oil and gas up front in the first 36 months. Then they level off, and then they just produce nice income based on a steady uh, production level for the next 25 to 40 years. The other thing that's occurring is, is that the number of barrels of oil that are economically extracted from a typical Bakken well has risen. Two years ago, it was around 375,000 barrels of oil per well. Now we're talking wells can exceed over a million barrels per well, and that all has to do with technology. These oil companies that are drilling are the major oil companies in the United States, the Continentals, the Occidental Petroleum, the Marathons, the XTOs, and what they're doing is perfecting the mechanism by which they're extracting the oil and gas, and each time they drill, that perfection is actually allowing them to make wells come down in price as far as cost, increase in total reserves extracted per well, and stretching or lengthening the amount of productive economic lives of the wells. Okay? Um, the Bakken by the numbers. Essentially, when you drill a Bakken well at today's prices, by the time you uh, drill the well, you pay the royalty owner his cut because he owns the minerals, you factor in the expenses of the well, you're generally looking at about a $33 million net profit per well. Very, very high substantial profit. The other thing that's nice about it is that you know, we, we do have our energy taxes, which of course are stimulating the economy. We generate a lot in the way of revenue as far as the wages. I mean, at this point in time, if anybody doesn't have a job in the United States, just show up in North Dakota, Montana. You'll have a job and you'll be uh, fully employed because the state is completely void of intellectual assets such as personnel. Um, right now, the state of North Dakota is averaging over 800,000 barrels of oil per day. The prediction is by the end of 2014, we'll be pushing over a million barrels per day. Just to give you kind of a side note, uh, in the 1970s, we finally reached a peak in this country of about 7.4 million barrels per day. In 2008, for the first time in almost 30 years, we dropped below 5 million barrels a day in output. 
That's why you saw oil prices drive all the way up to $145 a barrel. We were on a complete decline drilling five times as many wells for three times the price and finding smaller, weaker, lower producing wells as a result. So we were like a rat on a treadmill. Because of the changeover in drilling these shale wells where we weren't drilling dry holes, it was a matter of did you have a good well or a great well, what it has done, the oil, done for the oil companies has allowed us to be able to continue to drill without loss of capital and just figure out which basins actually make uh, the most profit per well. The Bakken by far is the number one leader in oil and gas being extracted per dollar invested. So from that standpoint, you know, the, the oil companies are just as excited as they've ever been. Uh, they recognize that they've got all the advantages going in their direction. Investors who have invested with them in stocks or through private investments are recognizing those same benefits. And it's a, it's a whole new day in the energy industry that we have not had in 50 years. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is the slide just popped up is that because of the success of the exploration, just in the state of North Dakota alone, they estimate there's 35 to 50,000 additional wells that have to be drilled. This basin, they call it a geological basin, is like a big bathtub just loaded with oil. And every time they drill a well, what they've determined is that there's not really that much depletion. There's not that much offset drainage. And so the oil companies are now preparing themselves for the fact that they'll be drilling in here for 10 to 20 years at 100% utilization or close to it. And they're talking about 35 to 50,000 wells just to successfully produce the oil that, that currently exists. Now, I want to also make note, that's only in two zones, the Bakken and the Three Forks. This thing is like a stacked or multi-layered cake where there's multiple formations from the surface down to about 15,000 feet that are productive. All the numbers I'm quoting and all the numbers that are being put out in the, in the media are really talking about two main zones, the Bakken and Three Forks. So I believe that the, project, the uh, predictions by Harold Hamm with Continental of having over 24 billion barrels of oil recoverable, I believe he's right, and he may be actually understating the potential. Um, the U.S. Geological Society came out this summer with an updated report, and they said, look, you know, eight years ago we said this, this Bakken would only have 210 million barrels of oil recoverable. They came out three years later and said, well, we've upped that. We think there's 3.2 million billion barrels of oil recoverable. They came back this summer and said, we've updated the report. Now we believe there's 7.4 billion barrels of oil recoverable. The problem with the USGS is they're always looking back, not forward. They're taking proven data. And in reality, I believe that the numbers in the next three reports will probably be double that 7 billion barrels. Now, the map I've just put up on the screen for you is a map of the state of North Dakota. And the entire state is not laden with Bakken. It's really predominantly in the northwestern part of the state. It covers about 9 to 10 counties. The Bakken formation itself, though, goes potentially all the way down to South Dakota, and it is almost double or triple the geographical dimensions when you cross into Canada and Montana. This thing is enormous in size. It is loaded to the hilt with hydrocarbons, and regardless of where you're drilling, it's not a question of will you find Bakken when you drill down 9,500 feet. It's a question of whether you have a good, great, or fantastic well, and that is really cha a game changer for everybody that's involved in the Bakken is that you're now just looking more at economic rates of return than you are success or failure. Uh, this gives you a kind of a, a pulled out or more of a macro oversight where this, you see how large this thing, uh, this, this particular play gets. Our standpoint and most of the big companies that we participate with, we're focused in a very specific uh, playground, if you will, we call the heart of the Bakken. We're staying right in the middle part of the trend. And that seems to be where most of the success is occurring, and that's all the reports that you're seeing. But this, this trend is quadruple the size of what we originally expected. It just continues to get better. The next slide is just a, a micro view, and it just shows you that we have narrowed down uh, what I would call the, the deepest part of the basin and the highest concentration of hydrocarbons. And it's not hard to understand because when you look at the next slide, which is, in fact, a three-dimensional, uh, 3D seismic kind of comprehension, the Bakken is a blanket formation. It covers everything. Below it is going to be the three force. It covers everything. Below that is the NISCU. And so from a, a uh, due diligence perspective, from understanding you know, where you can best drill, if you look at the small map to the right, it's kind of been defined by a core area, a premium core area, and areas that are in the process of being proven and developed. Well, when you start looking at the map to put it in, in kind of uh, a scale or a scope, the main part of what you see on the map on the right side of your screen covers about 15 million acres. It is huge. And when you take 15 million acres and realize underneath you lies these, these layered reservoirs that are loaded with oil and gas, 
it now becomes almost, it, to me, the Bakken is the largest real estate play in the country. It is about buying the minerals, leasing the minerals, drilling a well, and holding these minerals in perpetuity. So let's take a look at it from a schematic perspective. If you look at the schematic on the left-hand side, on the surface you'll have a drilling rig, and these wells will be drilled 9,500 foot down, deep enough to test or drill into the Bakken of the Three Forks Formation. The rock is extremely tight and very thick. So come, along comes the advent of horizontal drilling. Now horizontal drilling is simply a drilling technique, and the idea is, uh, is as follows. If you took a 7 and a half inch paper plate, you might go to a picnic, that's about the size of a well bore from the surface going all the way down. When you look at putting a 7 and a half inch plate into a Bakken formation, it's like a periscope on a submarine. That's about all the exposure you have. The rock's tight, you can't get out very far, and you're kind of trapped. But what the horizontal technique does, it allows the drilling company to turn a 90 degree radius and take that 7.5 inch periscope and go out almost two miles. The purpose in that is, when you look at it from a multiplicity perspective, now instead of having a 7.5 inch hole drilled vertically, you might have a 500 foot area of drainage. You now take and stretch that well out, that well bore out two miles. It's like the equivalent of drilling 20 or 25 vertical wells at a time. That is why the shale plays have finally been discovered in a commercial quantity is they did two things. They got the horizontal drilling to get them out and expose them to the reservoir. They're doing it two mile increments. And they came back in with technology on how to break open that tight rock and allow those gas molecules and oil molecules to free themselves. That's called a stimulation or a frack job. All I look at is kind of like jackhammering your driveway, your concrete driveway. If you went out with a garden hose today and wet down your driveway, and you try to go drink a little bit of water off of it, you'd get a raw tongue. But if you took a jackhammer and went in a line all the way down your driveway, and you jackhammered and loosened up the rock, the water would pool or migrate to where those cracks or crevices are. That's called the initial flush production from a horizontal well. And then over time, the water would continue to migrate to the weakest point or the lowest point of density, which in fact would be that crack along your driveway. What the oil and gas companies are doing is the same thing. They drill a horizontal well. They come in with a jackhammer called a frack job. They create all these fractures. We get big flush production, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 barrels of oil per day. It produces 60, 80, 100,000 barrels of oil in a year. And then all of a sudden, now that you've had that initial surge relax, you get this continual migration of oil and gas molecules that will come over the next 25 to 40 years. It's not difficult, but it took some really, really brilliant engineers to discover how to do it and successfully deploy it, and that's what the oil companies continue to do. Now, from a standpoint of, of looking at any kind of investment space, whether stock markets, bonds, real estate, the one thing I enjoy the most is looking at an industry who has solved the most complex problem, and you start to see decline curves, or what I call incline curves, like you see on this uh, screen currently. And what you're talking about is, is around 2005, EOG made the first horizontal discovery in the Bakken in its deepest part. That discovery set off a, almost an a 80 or 90 percent reduction in risk because they clearly demonstrated that there was oil trapped at the lowest point within the basin, which told the rest of the oil companies this basin is loaded to the hilt. All it needed was money. And that's really what the shale, game, the shale plays and the shale trends in the United States are about. It is a money game. You don't really have to worry about a dry hole. What you have to worry about is, I spent $9 million in a well. Will I get it back in 28 months or 40 months? And will I make three times my money or five times my money? And that sounds kind of crazy, but in fact, that's the reality is that these shale plays are that consistent and that reliable as far as results. Now, one of the things I can tell you, when you look at the chart on the, on the screen right now, is that our company, which is a small producer and a small independent pipeline and oil company in Dallas, we participated head to head, side by side, with the largest producers in the trend. Now the advantage that we've had is because of the reconnaissance, because of the activity involved with these majors, we participate and not only do we get to have the value of the wells that are drilled, we get all the technical data. So I have a full-time research team and what we're doing is finding out why is it that Whiting Petroleum is the number one operator in the Bakken? Why is Continental number two? All the way down to the bottom with Kodiak, what we get to see is the differences in their accounting, their operations, their technology. And when you put it all together, you end up having a very strong uh, research or due diligence on which operators may provide the, 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 the little edge, if you will, to make one investment better than another. That happens in every one of the basins around the country in that you have certain oil companies prefer certain areas. And as long as you, the investor, 
uh, kind of understand that there is a change from uh, the Bakken down to the Eagleford in South Texas. They're not all the same. They may be shale, but it takes very particular uh, nuances to make one successful or the other. Now, if you notice the screen on front, this is the fun part. If, if any of you ever get a chance to go to North Dakota and, in fact, look at the, um, look at the field itself, um, not only have they deployed technology in the drilling and fracking, but now they're talking about even from the, the rigs themselves, the drilling rigs. They put these rigs on somewhat rails, and they call them walking rigs. So they're able to drill a well vertically. They get it drilled vertically and horizontally. They jack it up. They slide it along rails. They move it 50 feet, and they drill the next vertical hole. They kick it off at an angle, and they drill a horizontal well side by side. What we're seeing up in the Bakken right now is as many as 6, 8, 15 wells per single pad site, which is saving millions and millions of dollars, not only in uh, mobility of the rigs, but time and personnel and, and transportation costs. So the oil companies are becoming proficient not only in extraction of hydrocarbons, but in the actual operational side, which is why it's driving prices down. I would say two years ago we rose as high as $12 million for a well being drilled in the Bakken. I just signed some uh, new wells that we got proposed to us from a couple of the operators. We were signing them at $7.2 million. That's almost $5 million cheaper than two years ago. And it all has to do with these efficiencies. Now, one of the things you might know as an investor or might want to know is that the, the uniqueness of the Bakken is not only is it liquids rich, but it also has to do with the fact that the state of North Dakota, uh, because it was a land rush back in the 1800s, they set up the most clear understanding of who has rights to participate in drilling a well and developing the minerals that are there. This particular state uh, process and procedure and the state rules have allowed small investors like you and I the opportunity to invest side by side with these major oil companies. It's called forced pooling. And all that means is if I own one acre inside of a 1,280 acre drilling unit, the oil company is going to drill the well must include me. They can't charge me more than they charge themselves. I get access to all the data. I get access to all the vendor discounts and all the advantages they have. They cannot exclude me. But it also means I don't have to participate. I can force them to drill the well. They can put me in a penalty phase, which I'm okay with, and I still get my interest back at a later date once they've made their money in the penalty back. So the unique part of the Bakken, besides being so heavily loaded with oil and gas and such a high success rate, is the fact that the oil companies are forced to let little guys like you and I in. Now what it, it does, it gives us a chance to truly be in the game on the same footing as major oil companies, which doesn't exist anywhere that I know of in the United States. And I've been doing this for 30 years. This slide, the next slide gives you a little bit of advantages of force pooling and, and uh, some of the force pooling provisions. But in a nutshell, it just allows us to be in the poker game, and the ante can't be so high we can't play. And that's really the, the, the most unique part of what's going on in this particular shell play. Now let's talk about uh, self-directed IRAs. Um, I think the, the thing that everyone on the phone should, should understand is that it is your money inside that account. And as long as you follow the IRS code, and as long as you use somebody like Intrust that you can, can have confidence will manage and facilitate and be the trustee for, you now have the luxury of looking beyond the, the public equity markets and say, where, where do I want to invest? I mean, maybe I don't want to be in uh, Facebook stock. Maybe I'd rather own something that's tangible. Now, the feedback I had this weekend, I had 70 of my wealthiest partners, if you will, in a room for three days going through all their investments, and we talked about stock market and all that's going on, where they sort of see the, the markets themselves. Now remember, that doesn't mean they're experts, but it's a very good litmus test to find out what the movers and shakers and the top 1% income earners in this country are thinking. And what they're thinking is, I need to put money in hard, tangible assets, whether it's water rights, royalties, minerals, land, real estate. If I can't see it, touch it, kick it, or feel it, then I've got a real issue with it. Now, when you look at the money you've invested in your self-directed IRA, you obviously have capital there that you need to put to work with the idea of being not only prosperous in that IRA, but you also have to have the ability to figure out how to make sure that investment with the money in the IRA is actually being deployed in the right direction. So let's go through a couple of them and just kind of explain what, what they are. A lease fund. What a lease fund is the opportunity to acquire the rights to a mineral lease with the ability of selling that mineral lease to a third party, with the third party being the company or the organization that intends on providing the expiration dollars and drilling it. Here's a good example. We might go out and find a mineral lease that we pay $2,000 per net acre from the mineral owner. 
We then know that when that lease becomes uh, active or there is a well proposed on it, there may be an increase in value as much as 50 to 300 percent of the value of the rights to that lease because now it has gone from being a maybe I'll drill to now I know it's going to get drilled with a well proposal. So there is a real opportunity in a lease fund to be able to put up money, participate with the company in taking it from one extracted value to the next based on the condition of the lease. Royalties and mineral funds are a little bit different. A royalty and mineral fund is where you actually want to acquire not the rights to lease or use the minerals, but in fact buy the minerals. Now I know there's a lot of mineral funds and royalty funds that are out there. Um, the biggest thing you need to understand about mineral and royalty funds is it is real property. You will own it in perpetuity. Uh, it is like owning a building. It's yours until you decide to sell it. Um, the biggest issue is like a building, if you don't have any tenants, you're not going to make any money. In the case of royalties and minerals, it's very important to know that when you take your self-directed IRA, it's good to buy the asset because it is ownership in perpetuity, but you have to look at how it's going to monetize or create liquidity. That must come in the form of having minerals that are in fact actually generating revenue through expiration dollars or being leased by, land, by uh, uh, lease funds and or oil companies who are paying you bonuses in dollars for the use or rights to develop those minerals. So I would just highly recommend that whenever you're looking at a royalty or mineral fund, just keep in mind, you can buy the real estate, but I have to have tenants in there generating revenue, or otherwise it's having an empty building. Um, additional investments that you can do with self-directed IRAs would be pipeline products. And what do I mean by that? Well, here's the fun part. Uh, we may drill 35 to 50,000 oil and gas wells up in North Dakota and uh, Montana, but they have to have a way to get that oil and gas out of the field. And in this case, it's going to require pipeline, what they call midstream, meaning it's the middle of the stream. It's not actually the development company. It's not actually the utility. It's the middle of the road getting the oil and gas from the field to the market. Pipeline products would be things like pipelines, uh, gathering lines, uh, natural gas processing plants, saltwater disposal wells, etc. This is an outstanding investment uh, for, uh, for a self-directed IRA because it is a tangible product. It is like owning a, a toll road, if you will. The oil companies must pay you a fee to run their oil and gas through your line. You typically don't take ownership of the oil and gas. So you don't have commodity risk, and you have a fee that's built in, and they must use your pipeline or your, or your gas plant every day because they have no other way of getting it moved to market. Now, the pipeline products, the reason why I'm excited about it is, is that the pipeline products are like the development companies when you take a raw piece of land that you're going to get entitled and get it uh, annexed into the city. Somebody's got to build the building. Somebody's got to put in all the infrastructure, and that's what this is. It's an infrastructure product play. Now, the last thing I would tell you is on the private equity side, oh, I just had a question pop up. I will touch on just because I, I, I should have mentioned it. It says, uh, how does the MLP model differ from this talk? The MLPs are master limited partnerships like the Kinder Morgans of the world. And what ends up happening on MLPs is that it is subject to the equity market risk of the share price going up and down. So essentially, Kinder Morgan goes out and cuts a contract with all the producers to move their oil and gas. Kinder Morgan then goes in and runs in all his overhead and his expenses and his partnership distribution rights. And then you as a shareholder get your pro rata share of those distributions of the net remaining capital that's left over. In the case of owning a product pipeline through your self-directed IRA, you don't have that extra added layer of Kinder Morgan, and you don't have a, a dilution from the standpoint of all the different uh, underlying components of a Kinder Morgan type of MLP. You actually are an equity partner in a, a particular pipeline, a particular gas plant, and those revenues are coming directly to you as a shareholder or as a, as a uh, true owner in that particular pipeline. So MLPs are great. My clients have made a ton of money in MLPs. I like them myself very much. But there is, I believe, a higher rate of return and a more valuable retention by looking at product pipeline or pipeline products directly, which brings in the private equity component of your self-directed IRAs. Private equity is just pretty simple. If I'm going to go put in a, right now, for example, my company, New Frontier Midstream, signed a contract, and what we're doing is we're putting in a, a big crude oil line in North Dakota. Well, you have to have private equity because whether you get bank financing or not, the equity would be the portion the bank or the lending institution requires to be a co-investment along with the bank credit facility. So private equity gives you, a self-directed IRA participant, the ability to look at an investment opportunity, some kind of a, maybe a gas plant or crude oil gathering line. You become the equity portion of that investment, 
which is then complemented by a third party lender or mezzanine lender or, or maybe a, a midstream developer. So the private equity can actually be in pipeline products as well as uh, some of the other energy investments that are available. Um, the last thing is, of course, tr traditional oil and gas development drilling. Um, the only thing I would caution everyone is that a self-directed IRA is generally, other than through like a Roth, has generally already been post-tax dollars placed into your self-directed IRA. There are a lot, substantial tax write-offs that go with oil and gas exploration. So as, as an example, we go out and drill a well for $10 million. By the time we look at the cost of drilling it, the labor, the sweat, the, the uh, non-renewable uh, applications of frac sand and fluid, 70 to 90 percent of that well is going to be deductible because it's not something that's tangible. The pipe, the equipment, and the wellhead is tangible. So in your self-directed IRA, you can utilize self-directed IRA for expiration, but you're going to trap some of those tax advantages inside of it. A lot of partners will end up uh, participating outside of their self-directed IRA and doing expiration, and then maybe after the first or second year, they'll actually do an acquisition and move those producing assets that are already past expiration into their self-directed IRA, which now allows growth inside the self-directed IRA. But there are some outstanding tax advantages, but as a caution, those tax advantages would be trapped in the IRA, maybe not best for uh, somebody that's trying to get some tax advantages because you're not going to get them out of the IRA. Um, now, let's talk about due diligence because everybody I know that I ends up looking at an oil and gas venture, the first thing I notice is most private investors don't have a clue which way a drill bit turns or how to really do due diligence. There's some very common things you need to look at. One, you need to look at who the, um, who the CEO, the principals of the firm are. I think if you Google, for example, my name, Troy W. Eckerd, um, there's probably 100 to 500 searches on Google regarding my name and my company. You need to look for the states they do business in. Are, do they have cease and desist orders? Have they had prior lawsuits? Do they have any current pending lawsuits? Because as I mentioned at my conference this weekend, it is the people. The people behind the investment is your number one thing you should look at. It can be the greatest opportunity in the world, but if you do it with a crook or somebody that has poor management skills, the results will reflect that, that people person uh, indicator. So I would say you know, use your search engine optimization. Use the, the different methodologies by going to the SEC or FINRA. Find out if these individuals have, in fact, had a, a prior record. And it will amaze you when you do a little bit of research that the person who has the nice suit and tie on that sounds really good on the phone, who presents himself very well, when you do a little background, it turns out that many of them have got all kinds of issues that, that they're never disclosing. So in this day and age, what I would tell each one of you on the phone is make sure you do your homework on the principles behind the firm first. One of the reasons we hold our private conference every year is for exactly that reason. We put all of our investors in the same room, and we say generally one of two things. You're either going to beat me like a pinata after three days because I don't tell the truth, or you're going to find that this is a great opportunity to learn and to meet your fellow partners and know that your investment has been handled in the correct manner. As you look at your self-directed IRA and, and, and well-respected companies like Intrust, who are providing you a great way to manage money, although they don't give you product recommendations, they're educating you on, on different investment vehicles that are out there, which then allows you to say, out of this big basket of opportunities, which one gives me the greatest sense of comfort that it has the right people, the right processes in place. I always want to know how long somebody's in business. I want to know what they've done before, how they built their track record, how they built their personality. Um, one of the things I learned a long time ago is I walked into Devon Energy's office and we were going to participate in a very expensive well, and I said, can you guys show me your track record? And they said, the track record is the well in front of you because this well has nothing to do with the last well, and we drill 2,000 wells a year. So what I asked them is, can you show me the way or the mechanism that you made the choice to drill this well? And they said, sure. They gave me the technological reason for drilling, and then they said, Troy, we have 10,000 locations a year to drill. This will be one of about 500 we drill this quarter. In our mind, this is the top 5% of all wells being drilled. So in the case of the Bakken, one thing that each one of you need to understand is there's 15 million acres being developed in the Bakken. There's only 174 drilling rigs available. We don't have the equipment. So every time the next 174 wells are being drilled, it is the top 1% locations of the 35 to 50,000 locations inside of the Bakken. That is one reason why the Bakken is so comforting, is that you know you're getting the best of the best possible locations that are being available by these publicly traded companies. That's the other reason why if you're a private equity player, you can feel comfortable who's actually developing the, the different wells. Um, transparency, 
you need somebody who's going to tell you like it is, show you like it is, back up the information. They're going to answer your questions. They're going to do it in a way, in a manner that you would expect. It's not, a, uh, not very difficult to get transparency because for me as an investor, if the transparency is not there, my answer is thanks but no thanks. But I want you to, to remind yourself that even though the products inside your self-directed IRAs may diversify, your standard of due diligence and your standard of expectation should never vary. Now, who are the sponsors of the investors? What you want to find out is, is when you're talking about a new investment is, you know, what's their background? How do they make their decisions? What does their teams look like? You know, what do they have as far as, uh, in particular, the, the necessary intellectual tools to decide the right investments? And this is just part of your due diligence is who, what, where, when, why, and who being probably the number one thing that I would focus on. Um, the IRS allows dollar for dollar write-offs. Uh, so you have a lot of write-offs in, in the expiration. There are a lot of tax deductions that come through the uh, pipeline investments. Royalty funds, lease funds predominantly generate positive uh, income, and they create growth as far as the value. Uh, they don't have much in the way of tax write-offs. So one of the things that you keep in mind in each one of these energy investments is you've got to look at the investment, you've got to look at the tax implications, and you must look at the, the time frame. Is it a three or five or six year hold? And then what does it look like as far as rates of return, and how are those returns distributed? Is it monthly, quarterly, annually? And how, how you feel comfortable with that type of investment inside of your IRA? And obviously this year, tax rates are gone through the roof. Uh, we had a, a large tax presentation by a well-respected tax firm on Saturday. And uh, I don't know about anybody else, one of the advantages you're going to have to really factor into your decision making in the next uh, four to ten years is that there is a big penalty if you decide to let somebody else manage your money, such as an uh, investment advisor, because now there's an additional 3.8% tax if you're not actively involved in your investments. I know many of these financial advisory firms are starting to lose a lot of money because their clients have figured out, I'm paying you a 1, 1.5% 1 advisory fee, but because I'm not active in my investments, I pay another 3.8% in taxes. So there is billions, if not billions of dollars coming out of these investment advisors' accounts, and they're going into tangible assets, or they're at least going into assets that you as the investor can put to work yourself. And under the new IRS code, or the new IRS interpretation of, of active participation, you're now being able to figure out how to avoid that 3.8% tax. It's very important you, you start looking at the tax code because you might think you have a low-risk investment. Maybe it's generating 4, 6, 8, 10% return. And now all of a sudden you start losing 3.8% because you're not actively involved. And I don't think the investment advisors will tell you that just because I don't think they want to lose the money out of your account. Uh, the last, next slide is just talking about intangible drilling costs and how they affect your adjusted gross income. I'll just give you a simple model. Uh, let's say you make a half a million dollars in income this year. Under the current tax code, you're going to pay a certain tax rate up to 400000 then you pay 39.6% for the last 100,000. Your blended adjusted gross income might mean you're subject to an average of 36 or 37% income tax on the federal basis. Your, most of your tax deductions are phased out after $200,000. So now you're looking at a tax bill between 100 dollars to $300,000 depending on your position. And the 300,000 I think is high, somewhere between 100 and 180,000 dollars in taxes. So what you want to do is look at energy and say, how can I achieve my investment goal? invest in things I'm comfortable with, how can I utilize the tax implications of each one of those investments to uh, at least manage my, my current tax liability bill. But I can tell you self-directed IRAs are a great way to trap value and growth gained assets inside of your IRA. There will be some tax advantages that are trapped inside there depending on the investment vehicle. But for right now to this year going forward, all of us that are in the higher income bracket Better make tax observation and management our number one objective because the erosion to our account is going to be pretty substantial. I know we've run a little bit over time, and the last slide, I'm going to turn it back over to Gary. I want to tell you one thing before I let you go uh, from my perspective. One, oil and gas is not that difficult. Oil and gas is the core foundation of a lot of my wealthier clients' portfolios. The biggest problem with oil and gas, when you look at it, whether it's in a self-directed IRA or on the outside of your self-directed IRA, is you must use your common sense and you must find the right company to work with because we are in the biggest revolution in the entire history of oil and gas going on right now, and we are barely in the first inning. We have thousands of wells to drill, dozens of states to develop this energy in, and we need everything from saltwater wells to equipment to wells being drilled the pipelines and gas plants all the way down the line to uh, actually production facilities. So again, thank you for your time. I know I talk a little fast. Um, I do this for a living, so I always kind of know what I'm doing. I'm real excited about it. 
and I appreciate the respect and time you gave me on the phone. I see there's a few questions, but uh, what I'd like to do is go ahead and allow that uh, to turn it back over to Gary. And Gary, thanks again for allowing me to participate as a co-host with you on this. My pleasure, Troy. Thank you so much for joining us and for, um, for the insights you provided. A, a wonderful insight on the Bakken and everything going on up there, and I think some of its potential and uh, how it compares to the oil and gas opportunities of, of yesteryear, so to speak. So uh, really, really wonderful insight and very much appreciate you sharing it with us today. Um, we do have, have a few questions. I'm going to try to touch on a couple of the simple ones first, and then um, uh, we may need some elaboration on one of those that, that's listed here. Um, Chris, you asked about um, getting a copy of this presentation. Yeah, I, um, I, I jotted your name down here, and I can email you a copy of the slides once we're wrapped up. And, if there's anyone listening today who would like a copy uh, of the presentation materials, please just send me an email and uh, request that, and I'll be happy to, to share them with you. Um, somebody else had asked um, about uh, a link to this presentation if they want to listen to it again. And we will have it posted on the Entrust Group website. It should be up there by Thursday latest. Um, again, if anyone would like that link, just send me a note. It doesn't have to be in detail, just in the subject line. Please send webinar link, uh, Eckerd Global, or Bakken, or something to indicate this specific webinar, and I'll be happy to send it once it's um, made available. Uh, there's a question, there's a few different questions from the same individual, Rakesh, about um, tax returns within SD IRAs, and I'm trying to read how, how complex. I guess I'll make a general comment, and then, then Troy, he's asking as well, how complex is the tax situation with this investment? From a general standpoint with IRAs, um, your earnings grow tax-deferred or tax-free depending. Um, that's the vast majority of the time. There, there can be situations where taxes arise. It's typically um, with certain types of businesses that you run or if you're leveraging uh, inside your IRA. In other words, if you have your IRA borrowing funds, uh, the percentage of the investment that is allocated to the loan that your IRA takes can be subject to um, to income taxes over, you know, during certain circumstances. So I'd want to better understand your scenario um, and maybe chat one-on-one -on -one separately to try to respond to anything specific. But um, Troy, you may have some comments specifically with regard to oil and gas investing in terms of the taxes. I know yeah, you expanded on it, but you may have a little more you can add. Well, there's generally two ways you're going to invest in oil and gas, and the tax reporting comes in two different formats. Either you're involved in a, a joint venture where you actually would receive a scheduled K-1 and that uh, K-1 would be provided, uh, generally speaking, if the, if the issuer, the company that you're investing with, if they're doing their job correctly, you'll have a K-1 issued on or before March 15th, the year following the activity. And in that K-1 would provide the intangible write-off or the deductions. It would provide the revenue. It would provide you your cost basis. And of course, it would also break out the tangible part of your investment, such as the pipe and the equipment, and, and that would be uh, deplete, uh, depreciated over the next five to seven years. So the reporting mechanism is either in a K-1, or if you invest in a direct ownership, which is the way a lot of our partners do it, you actually own a percentage of a well. You have a recorded ownership in the courthouse. That's called a working interest. In that case, you get a 1099 at the end of January, and you get a Schedule C provided by, at least in our company, we provide a Schedule C, and it breaks the same thing down as a K-1 does, but the difference with a, uh, a direct participation versus a partnership or a joint venture is that you now have the flexibility of how you allocate those losses and those depreciable items because effectively a uh, Schedule C gives you that flexibility, whereas a K-1 does it on behalf of all the partners inside of that particular partnership vehicle. Um, I noticed there was a couple of other questions to, uh, to follow up on that, which is, you know, how safe is the drilling in the Bakken environmentally wise? It's extremely safe. I know there's a lot of bad publicity out there, but I believe that when you're talking about, you know, 2,000 wells being drilled a year, you have minimal incident with regard to 
uh, the both environmental and the operational uh, aspects of drilling. I've been drilling for 28 years. I've never had a single lawsuit or a single claim filed back against myself or any partners for any wells we drilled, and we drilled hundreds and hundreds of wells. We also take the same insurance coverage in our company as the major oil companies provide. So when they're talking about a $500 million or a billion dollar insurance policy, we have the same insurance coverage as a partner with maybe a Occidental Petroleum, a Marathon, or, or a, uh, any one of the major companies. So again, it's not that you don't have risk, it's that you do have massive amounts of coverage and you're dealing with the majors who you participate with side by side. Um, the other question I think I saw in there, um, Gary, was that, you know, how do you make an investment in this opportunity and, and you know, kind of what the investments range? Um, I can't speak on behalf of many of the companies that are involved in various aspects, but typically you're looking at investments in products like this around the $25,000 minimum range. Some investments will be as high as a quarter million to half a million dollars depending on the structure. Um, from the standpoint of you looking at it as a uh, investment for yourself to your self-directed IRA, I think it's always prudent to look at your goals, the amount of capital you have uh, available, and then what the investment does to meet your objectives inside that IRA. So I might be a lot more of a risk taker myself personally with non-IRA funds, meaning I might go drill oil and gas wells outside of my IRA, but inside my IRA I'm going to probably invest in either royalties, a lease fund, or pipelines because they're relatively uh, on the lower end of the risk scale versus expiration. So I manage my expiration on the outside. Inside my self-directed IRA I'm looking for more conservative investments that have longer term growth and I'm just looking for those coupon clipper 7, 8, 9 percent type of returns on there. Um, there is a, um, there's not a way to generally invest in a kind of a blended portfolio yet. We are looking at uh, opportunities, and I know others are thinking about doing this, where you might be able to have a participation spread your risk across multiple spaces, but there's not one that I know of that exists now. And keep in mind, you always have, um, there's dozens and dozens of investors or investment products out there. Um, the biggest thing I can tell you from my experience is you must do your due diligence because there is a tremendous amount of difference between one investment product in the Bakken versus another. Just because you hear the word Bakken doesn't mean it's a good investment because if the deal is structured incorrectly or to the disadvantage of you as the investor, it doesn't matter how good the well is, if you paid three times the cost of the well, most of your profit was eaten up in fees. So it is important that you look at the deal itself. Uh, Gary, again, I'll turn it back to you. Well, yeah, I, thanks, Troy, and, and uh, great responses there. I, I want to see if, if we can extract a little bit more uh, from you on the, the question of how would I make an investment in this opportunity. Um, you answered that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just see if there's a little more you might add. Um, most of the people on this call, I'm suspecting, uh, they're aware that you can make investments through uh, you know, public securities that, that would have an interest up in the Bakken. Um, but in looking at some of the private companies, I know that there are many, many players that are doing different things up there that, that people can look at. And when we met a few months ago, I, I don't remember all the details, but we spoke a little bit about some of the differences between the privately held companies and the things they're doing and the approaches they're taking. And I wanted to see if there's anything you could add on that, because as I recall, there are some some significant differences between uh, the different players out there when somebody who is, um, you know, is taking a look at a driller or, um, you know, somebody making a play up in the Bakken. Well, the, the one thing I can tell you that we've, we've been in the Bakken for three years. It is a purely empirical quantitative play, meaning that there's a lot of data. There's, it's the comparison of 20 different oil companies, comparing which company operates more efficiently, which company extracts more oil, which company is able to stay in budget. And there's a whole matrix of, of risk evaluations made on each operator. From an investor's perspective, if I'm, if I'm on this call with Intrust and I'm listening in with self-directed IRA money, my number one objective is how do I have a fair opportunity to make money and not be skinned alive from an ethical integrity perspective? That goes back to some of the due diligence items that I, that I mentioned in the slideshow. So if I can get if I can narrow the field from 20 possible companies that may be involved in royalties or minerals or expiration or lease funds in the box and narrow it down to two or three that I believe are ethical and honest, then it boils down to the individual companies 
um, the differentiation, how they believe and why they believe their particular investment makes sense and, and what kind of management expertise they bring to the table. So what you and I talked about when we met six months ago is that um, our company takes the position that we are fiduciaries and we manage energy investments on behalf of investors. And it's our objective to find assets, whether it be a pipeline or drilling or leases or royalties. And we go out and we work to find the best opportunity from an asset perspective, how to capture it at the best economic uh, uh, value proposition, and then bring it to our partners with the idea that um, it, we are managing those dollars on behalf of those partners. And so when we look at our, our, our structure, we try to do everything on a, on a cost basis. It costs X, we have to manage it for Y, but we fully disclose it. The biggest issue I see in energy investment is the failure to disclose. Um, I know that there are, are, for example, when we go out and drill an oil and gas well in the Bakken, when we take our combined lease cost and our combined drilling cost, we might be at um, $11,000 to $12,000 cost per acre for both drilling and for uh, the lease acquisition cost. We know that there are a Hello? need to understand that it is finding the right party who understands where the, where the value is, how to capture that value, and then bring it to an investor who really gets the, the value transferred to them and not gobbled up by a middleman fee, and that's real important. Um, I don't know if I gave you the exact answer or, or kept on track with that, Gary, but that's, that's essentially what we, you know, we talked about uh, six months ago. Yeah, that, that's terrific. I just I wanted to, to give you a chance to expand on it a little bit. Sure. Um, and I, I think that was terrific. So I, I'm not sure um, if it happened to others. I just uh, kind of lost the audio for about maybe five to ten seconds there. So if that happened to anyone um, still on the call, I apologize. Um, don't know Gary, what happened there. But. Gary, I would like to throw in one last thing. Sure, that, you go know, right ahead. Try. Um, on our website, which is www.eckerglobal.com, what we do on a continual basis is we put on there educational tools. We want to make you the smartest investor out there because the smartest investor does two things. When they feel comfortable investing, they actually take action. And the second thing is the more educated we make our partners, it allows us the ability to have smarter I'm not sure if it was just Troy that was lost or if there is something with our um, service provider. So if uh, the attendees can still hear me, this is Gary with Entrust. Um, I apologize uh, for the technical issues. I, it, it sounds, based on a, a chat room comment, yeah, I, I seem to be able to be heard just fine by the audience, but um, I don't know why we've lost Troy. So if there are other questions that folks have, um, please go ahead and key those in. I, I think we've handled them uh, in full, but certainly after this uh, presentation wraps up, um, 
feel free to contact uh, Troy directly at 800-527-8895 or via his email that you see on the screen. Uh, and he'll be happy to, to help out or respond to questions specific to the Bakken or uh, Eckerd Global in particular. And if you have questions about self-direction, if you'd like a copy of the presentation or the link, just either give me a call at 800-392-9653, extension 245, or um, send me an email at the email address on the screen now as well. And uh, whether today, tomorrow, or a week from now, uh, feel free to get in touch and we'll try to um, provide you with the information you're seeking. And again, we will have a link to this webinar on our website in the next day or two. I've gotten several emails from folks already. I'll be responding to those with the link once that's ready. And I'll also be sending a copy of the slide deck uh, to anyone who would like to have it. So, um, I think Troy uh, must be lost permanently here. I just don't know what, what transpired. But thank you so much for um, attending today, for your interest, and uh, most of all for your patience with our technical challenges today. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Please stand by.